Thank you, Books Are Magic, and thank you to all of the writers who are here tonight. This is a particularly special Red Ink for me because, I mean, it's always special, but I really, really love all of the writers on this panel, as I always do, but you guys are just like, oh, my heart. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Um, and I, I wanted to just start by saying for those people who are joining us who don't know what Red Ink is, it's a quarterly series I started um, several years ago. Uh, to make a space for women writers. And it's conversations only. So th there won't be readings tonight, although um, I am asking Janine to read from a poem and I'm gonna be reading from a poem for a question. Um, but instead we're gonna be having a discussion here. And the, the um, title of the series comes from Mrs. Dalloway, um, a Virginia Woolf quote in Mrs. Dalloway, which is, he thought her beautiful, believed her impeccably wise, dreamed of her, wrote poems to her, which ignoring the subject, she corrected in red ink. So red ink makes me think of vitality, blood, the monthly cycle, correcting history and making a mark on the world. And all of these writers who are here with us tonight are doing that. Um, I wanted to start out by um, asking Janine to read this gorgeous poem by Jane Hirschfield that she shared on Facebook when she was talking about this uh, um, panel. So Janine, do you mind reading that? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yes, I'd love to read this poem. I, I love this poem. So thank you, Michelle. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Books mm -hmm. Are Magic. It's such a delight to be here with these writers. Yeah, I can't even say. Okay, this is a poem called Heat by Jane Hirschfield. My mare, when she was in heat, would travel the fence line for hours, wearing the impatience in her feet into the ground. Not a stallion for miles, I'd assure her, give it up. She'd widen her nostrils, sieve the wind for news, be moving again, her underbelly darkening with sweat, then stop at the gate for a moment, wait to see what I might do. Oh, I knew how it was for her, easily recognized myself in that wide lust, came to stand in the pasture just to see how it played, offered a hand, a bucket of grain, a minute's distraction from passion, the most I gave. Then she'd return to what burned her, the fence, the fence, so hoping I might see, might let her free. I'd envy her then, to be so restlessly sure of heat and need and what it takes to feed the wanting that we are. Only a gap to open the width of a mare, the rest would take care of itself. Surely, surely I knew that, who had the power of bucket and bridle. She would beseech me, sidle up, be gone, as life is short, but desire, desire is long. That's so stunning. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so that's such a great way to start off our discussion. And I wanted to start by asking each of the panelists, what desire means for you as a writer and in your work? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I like to go first and get it over with because I'm <laughs> nervous at the beginning. Go ahead. And Jill can really tell you that I'm nervous because I got a hold of her today going, well, what are you going to ask me? I'm so freaked out. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to get it out of the way. Of course. Um, uh, or to, to get us started. How's that? Um, so I've been thinking about this ever since I emailed you earlier today about, and, and the first thing I think is that um, I don't know how to say what desire is about in my work, but I know how to say what it's about in the artist. So for me, the very act of writing is because I do this, you know, because if I write nonfiction, I'll just say that. I don't know if it's true or not, but let's say I write nonfiction. And even when I write fiction, it feels a little bit to me or a lot to me like nonfiction. So essentially what it is, is an attempt or a desire on my part to find the meaning 
of my life, whether I'm writing about my experience or somebody else's, I really have all my life had this um, certainty that there's a meaninglessness to our existence. And I've tried to grapple with that in a million ways um, through all the years that I've lived. But with writing, um, it works the best because you can think about something that happened or you can make something up that happens and you can find a way to make it mean something. So in the wider world that's not writing, I still have that feeling of meaninglessness at the core of everything. But in the world of my writing, I'm constantly trying to use words and images to create meaning. So that's my desire as the writer. I can't speak to the desire of people who read the work, what they find in it, but um, there. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Who wants to go next? I'll go. Um, I, I was. I agree with so much of what Joanne said about you know the meaningless and making meaning and using images and language and sound to do that. But I think when you first said the question, I was like, I, I don't know. I don't have a. I don't know. I have an answer for that. But then I. I am writing desire. But I think what I'm interested in when I write is what's the space between our wants versus our needs and how we often confuse the two. You know, there's something that you think, oh, I need this, but really it's a desire and vice versa. So I'm interested in that. And I'm, I'm very interested in the things that we want that we are ashamed to want, um, things that are stigmatized, um, I'm interested in the desire to be normal, whatever that means, the desire for the American dream, which is a dream. I'm interested in, I don't know, just the endlessness of it, the searching of it and how that makes a person. I feel like, you know, once one is satisfied, another one crops up in its place. You know what I mean? It's like the head of the Hydra or something like that. But yeah, that's as close as I can get to that. It's terrific. Can I jump in on that, Michelle? Yeah, please. Um, because I think um, in listening to both Joanne and Dantiel that there's this um, way that I think about desire as urgency. And when I teach writing, I talk about desire as fuel. Like it's like if you, if you, if you deprive yourself of the fuel and I like what you said about stigmatized desire because I think for women, almost all desire is stigmatized. And so, you know, even ambition can be a form of desire and that's, even that is stigmatized for women. So this idea of desire as urgency to compel us toward the thing that, that we yearn for that, that actually does create meaning, you know, that is meaning for us. And so, um, so in thinking about tonight, um, I'm an etymology geek. And um, so I was just like doing some Googling, you know, on desire. And it turns out that Octavia Butler talked a lot about desire, which I thought was really cool and talked about um, desire as a form of becoming. And this was in Brain Pickings, Maria Popova's blog. And um, apparently desire comes from the Latin without a star and refers to the idea of yearning for direction toward our own becoming. So I just thought that was beautiful and like was a much more elegant and eloquent way of saying like exactly how I like to think of it, like leaning into the desire. Um, but like what you just said about until about the difference between need and want, like really feeling um, like the empowerment of, of wanting like pure want, like in the Hirschfield poem, you know, like to just be able to be that clear about it and own it. Yeah. I love that you just shared the etymology of that. I had no idea. And that is so cool. Um, it's so, so beautiful. Catherine, what about you? I just, I love the way you've all spoken about this. It's really beautiful. Um, and I suppose that, you know, that, that feeling of kind of searching, like the endless search that I think motivates the desire to write in itself is something I, I think a lot about partly in the sense that um, in terms of my own urges to write, the, the desire to write is very strong, 
but it's not clear to me what it's a desire for <laughs> in the sense that I never know I never know what it is exactly that I want to write until I have written it so there's this, there's that strange feeling of kind of urgency and like I you know I want to be there in in this field <laughs> I have to be in this field doing this but I don't know what it is that I'm aiming for and I and and I never know until until it's done and I reach some end, some sort of end. And then I feel like often it's in retrospect that one can clarify actually what one was wanting and trying to create. But at the time, it's a strange kind of knowing and not knowing, but it's a very kind of deep urge that remains hazy at the same time, which is quite strange. <laughs> I really relate to that. Absolutely. Um, so Don Teal in um, Milk Blood Heat, which I had the honor of reviewing for the Washington Post. Yes, thank you so much. It was such a gorgeous review. <laughs> oh, it was my honor to read this book and write about it. Um, for anyone who has not read this, run out and buy it. It is one of the best short story collections I've ever read. Um, so in one of the stories in the book, it's called The Hearts of Our Enemies. Um, there's a teenage daughter in that story who's upset with her mom for not going through with an, with like not going all the way through with an affair and still confessing her mild transgression to her husband. And you write in this story, in all of this, Margo was mostly mad that her mother had wanted something and didn't take it. And the consequences were the same. So what is it about unfulfilled desires that you're interested in writing about? I think in the same way that success is this way, I think it's sometimes scary to get what you want as well as to not get it. And so I think there's so much about, you know, if, you, if, we're, if we're thinking about it from the aspect of yearning, there's so much that we yearn towards, but we may never get, we may never fulfill it or we do get it. And then it becomes like, oh, that's not actually, um, it actually isn't doing anything for me. So I think, I don't know, I think it's just part of the human condition, like unfulfilled desire or unnamed desire, you know, whatever it is. And so I think in that story in particular, it's really, you know, Margot thinking like, oh, you know, you can be shamed for the things that you want. You can be shamed for the things that you don't take. So in all of this, you might as well just do what you want to do because people are gonna have their judgments about whatever that thing is regardless. Yeah. I was muted. Yeah, that's that is so true. Um, thank you. So next, I'll, I'll ask Joanne in your new collection Festival Days. It's so exciting to see this new collection coming out in the world. It's it's coming out Tuesday, right? Am I correct? Is that the pub day? Um, and I have a profile of Joanne forthcoming in a big newspaper. So you guys will see that next week. But um, Joanne, so in your gorgeous book, desire is a theme that runs throughout all of your work. Um, but in this book in particular, whether it's the will to survive seen in Werner, a, a, a Werner, a painter you met who jumped out of a burning building in New York City, or a terminally ill woman who went to Dr. Kevorkian to end her life. In the latter essay that I just spoke about, Sherry, you write about the way she experiences the world as she's ill. And I'm quoting you here. You say, the trees on her street vibrate in the afternoon sunlight, the dying leaves so brilliant that she somehow feels she's never seen any of this before. Fall and the way the landscape can levitate with color and even her simple cup of green tea in the afternoons with milk and honey in a thick white mug, warm, her hand curled around it, or the newspaper folded beside it, or a halved orange on a blue plate sitting next to it. It's all lovely beyond words, really. So one of the many things that I love about your work is how whether you are writing about yourself or other people, even the quietest moments are infused with a significance, um, a desire to hold on to this world. Even the act of holding a cup of tea is imbued with meaning. 
And I, I guess I'm wondering if it's a conscious choice, all of these moments of illumination, or if it's something that happens subconsciously for you. Well, I think it, it might be both. Um, but in the piece that you just read from in that moment, um, it's a person who has discovered that her life is over essentially. And every day that she lives is just another day that moves her toward her death at that point. So I think she might have maybe a month to go at the part that you read. So if you as the writer or we as writers imagine our way into that moment in this person's life and imagine what it would feel like to have a cup of tea with the realization that there won't be any more tea, there won't be another orange to peel, there won't be another autumn with these beautiful leaves. Um, that the only thing you can imagine is how much she would desire to stay on earth. And I think she did. And of course, because she died and I didn't get to talk to her about that. I had to imagine my way through it and speculate for myself on how she might've felt about that moment. But on the other hand, Werner came all the way to his moment of death and then he got to live. So Werner could speak to me about what it felt like to have that happen, to absolutely know that you're gonna die. And then suddenly your life is handed back to you in the way that Sherry's life was pulled away from her. So I think that, um, I think that a lot of my book festival days turns out to be about death in one form or another. Um, and, and so, Therefore, imagining your way into all of these deaths, one essay after another, means that you're imagining for yourself what it would feel like to have everything around you. Like in this moment, the beautiful soft lamplight that I'm looking at, you know, the, your faces, the faces of other artists, to imagine that this is all shimmering and temporary and that I can actually say the moment when it's gonna disappear is really, um, it's really moving and overwhelming, actually. To, if we could all only live in that moment forever, we would appreciate every cup of tea we have. See, like every cup of tea we have, except this cup of tea has beer in it. Yeah, I bet <laughs> most doesn't. Um, but yeah, anyway, thank you for, thank you for your kind words and, and, um, and the opportunity to just to think about this stuff is really interesting. Oh, it's such an honor. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Catherine, in your stunning book, Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again, and this book is already out, right? Is it out in the States? It, the pub date has already passed. It is here. People can buy it. Um, I loved this book so much, and it's so important. And I want to quote from the section that is about desire. Um, where you say that women's sexuality is frequently punished. Women are routinely harassed and their bodies policed. They are constantly reminded of their susceptibility to male violence and made to feel responsible for it. Shame, fear, cultural prescriptions and trauma, often sexual trauma, can be profound inhibitors to sexual enjoyment. Yet women are urged to claim their desire with confidence. No wonder many women have a complicated relationship to their desire. No wonder it may need careful eliciting and that they are easily inhibited. So I'm wondering if you could, can elaborate on this and can desire ever be uncomplicated? Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, so this, this book is partly about um, what I really began to feel worried about in the last few years and I suppose in the wake of me too um the way that a lot of this kind of increased discussion about you know sex particularly between men and women and how to um you know how to make sex better how to prevent sexual violence how to kind of try and you know undo these really pernicious dynamics between um men and women that a lot of the rhetoric in which that was being couched was very well-meaning, but it felt to me that it was often really addressing the woman. 
and in particular addressing the woman's kind of subjectivity and her sexual kind of persona with the requirement that in order to keep ourselves safe and to be able to experience pleasure, we need to know what we want and then say very clearly what we want. And that disturbs me because I think that the sexually kind of punitive culture that we live in means that it's really difficult for us to say exactly what we want, partly because we know, <laughs> because we have our ears and our eyes open, that those kind of confident expressions of sexual desire are often what come back to harm us in court cases, in rape trials, and just in the everyday, you know, those those exact expressions of desire literally get re read out in court as grounds to exonerate men from sexual violence. So this emphasis on like saying what you want seems to me, you know, problematic, but also that I think that kind of sexual culture can make it hard for women to find their desire, to be able to be in touch with it um, because it's risky to feel sexual desire because to feel sexual desire is to open yourself up to you know, the pleasures of vulnerability but also the risks of vulnerability. Um, so I'm, I'm really wary of attempts to kind of improve sex that want to insist on the possibility and the desirability of this kind of mode of, of relating to sexual desire. But also because I think, you know, it's partly about kind of gender and power relations and, you know, in, inequalities of power. But it's also that I don't think desire is, um, is ever just something that's there ready to be extracted. So if the conditions are right, we can really experience desire in this very simple, uncomplicated, urgent, spontaneous way. But so often the conditions aren't right, you know, the culture that we live in, the, the relationship that we're in, the socioeconomic situation that we're in, all these other aspects of our identity and our lives make that kind of discovery of desire really complicated. Um, so I kind of, you know, the book is, is partly about trying to start from that complexity as opposed to sort of trying to push it away in a kind of more wishful way when we're trying to think about how to, you know, improve sex for women. Um, so I think that, you know, if, if conditions are right, desire can feel like so magical and alchemical and just and just like it appears from nowhere. And then, you know, if we're lucky, it can lead to the most wonderful things. But I think the realities of life for so many women, and not just women, but you know, particularly women in this book, are such that that access is not easily available. And that leads to so much unhappiness, so much bad sex that may not be strictly assault, but is humiliating and unpleasant and coercive. And I want to think about how we can try and create those kind of social and cultural conditions that mean that individually, people stand a greater chance of accessing that kind of, you know, magical space that's actually very complicated, but that can feel very simple if we're lucky. But it's not simple. Definitely not. And I really feel like this book is going to open up a lot of important conversations. So thank you for writing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and last but not least, Janine, who's the part that burns came out recently and I had the honor of blurbing this gorgeous memoir. Um, I, I wanna ask you Janine about a part in your book where you say fire is not the only lick that scars. I wanna burrow under the skin of this world and feel its bready heat. Throughout your memoir, I was struck by all of the language about the natural world. Um, so this kind of comes back to the etymology of desire that you were talking about before. But in your book, you know, you talk about atoms, plasmas, cells. Can you talk about why you were drawn to, to that as a theme, as one of the themes in your books, in your book? Well, thank you for that, Michelle. Thank you for that question and for blurbing my book. <laughs> And reading it, um, and because you have read it, you know, um, you know, I'm dealing with the aftermath of, of trauma in the book as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and so the I think that the the section that you read and the 
the focus on the natural world, but also specifically the body um, is very much about my interest in, um, well, and this is really everything that you, that you said was so interesting to me, Catherine, as you can imagine, but um, this idea of what, what is it really to be embodied? You know, what is it to actually live in our body? Um, and there's a, there's a section in the book um, that I wrote, that I co-wrote with my daughter, and it talks about, we're having a conversation, and it talks about this idea of like self with a capital S. And this idea to me is like the self being the physical body, but also whatever that thing is that makes us alive, you know, that life force, you know, I'm not specifically talking in a religious or spiritual way, but, but that combination of, you know, life force that is our living self um, within the body. And so that idea of self with a capital S and the integration of you know, those, those forces that, that ultimately make us who we are, because I spent so much time in my younger years living completely outside of the physical body, you know, really just observing my physical body from a distance, really just being very lightly tethered to it by a very fragile string. <laughs> and so, you know, and you also, Catherine talked about like the vulnerability of desire or even the vulnerability of pleasure. So I think, you know, that all resonated very strongly with me because to be able to open up to, you know, just even sensation, even just the risk of sensation, you know, um, so yeah, so the emphasis, and I think one of the doorways to that is the physical world. I think, you know, being just present enough in the body to be aware of the physical world, to observe it, to sense it, you know, to live in the senses, um, just in that very kind of like, you know, baby step kindergarten way. But at the same time that I say that, I think it's fair to acknowledge that that's not really easy for most of us you know it it just if it were we wouldn't have a multi-billion dollar mindfulness industry trying to teach us how you know to just be in the our be present with what is in the world so so for me that emphasis was um was really about that theme in the book, but just one last comment toward that. I'm reading um, Pam Houston's Deep Creek right now, and she has a beautiful bit um, right where I am at in the book, which is at about the one third mark, where she's talking about her writing process being that of observing what is in the world and waiting for that moment where just, you know, like, and I think all everybody who writes will know what I'm saying or what she's saying, which is also how I write, which is just this thing. It's like, a, she calls it a glimmer. Um, so it's something that catches your attention and she writes, she captures it and she forbids herself, no interpretation, not trying to make meaning out of it, nothing, just the thing itself. And then she has a file in her computer called glimmers. <laughs> and then she um, will later go into that file and select from those physical observations, sensory observations, and see sort of like which ones she can juxtapose. And if they start to talk to each other to create a kind of a, you know, an emergent meaning. And I thought that was so beautiful because I think that's just so exactly right. Like the meaning. And I think it kind of points toward what you were saying at the very beginning, Joanne, about like writing into the meaning. And Catherine, you too were so like, I don't know, you know, I, I, I have to do it, but I don't know. And like that balance of not knowing, but the urgency of finding out, but like starting with that 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 glimmer that that Pam Houston is talking about so and I think it does it does start in the outside world the world that we all share you know it's like where that lives not like inside of me or um you know yeah I think it starts with the world we share I really love that that's beautiful um and I love the idea of keeping a file of glimmers <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to remind the audience that if you at any time you want to ask some questions, you can post them and if there is time at the end, we'll get to some. So there's a Q&A box at the bottom where you can submit questions. 
Um, but now for my next question, it involves a poem. So I'm sharing it in the chat for everyone who wants to read it. I, I'm, I'm a person who needs to see something while I'm hearing it. So in case that's you too, this is a poem. It's one of my favorite poems called Sorrow Is Not My Name by Ross Gay. Um, so I'm going to read the poem and then ask the question. No matter the pull toward brink, no matter the florid, deep sleep awaits, there is a time for everything. Look, just this morning a vulture nodded his red grizzled head at me, and I looked at him, admiring the sickle of his beak. Then the wind kicked up, and after arranging that good suit of feathers, he up and took off just like that. And to boot, there are on this planet alone, something like 2 million naturally occurring sweet things, some with names so generous as to kick the steel from my knees, agave, persimmon, stickball, the purple okra I bought for two bucks at the market. Think of that. The long night, the skeleton in the mirror, the man behind me on the bus taking notes. Yeah, yeah. But look, my niece is running through a field calling my name. My neighbor sings like an angel and at the end of my block is a basketball court. I remember my color's green, I'm spring. So in that poem, it's one of my favorite poems and it means even more to me reading this poem and also teaching it during the pandemic. I taught it to my NYU students. Um, and today, especially reading that poem, it felt, really felt like spring for the first time here in Brooklyn. Um, I love that this poem implies that no matter um, that with all of the sorrow in the world, there's joy too and hope. And after such a significant year for all of us that included a global pandemic, um, Black Lives Matter marches, voting Trump out of the White House, and many, many other significant things. I'm wondering for all of you how your desires have shifted, if they have at all. Um, are you, do you feel like you have a different relationship with your desires, um, given everything we've been through in the past year? And if so, how? Yeah, I think uh, for me, one of the things that became very clear in 2020 is that my body uh, requires something of me to to function, to run healthily. Um, you know, it's very easy. Uh, and Janine was talking about this to be become untethered from your body, right? To think of it as just like a product or something that's there and it's just there, but like it needs something of you. It needs several things from you. Um, and so I think one of the things that I have desired and will desire like going forward is just like figuring out what my body needs and a way that you know I can kind of fight my mind which is the thing that keeps me from often doing the things that my body desires of me so like you know figuring out ways I can get it moving figuring out ways to nourish it the best I can figuring out ways to you know to hydrate the way that I can and so yeah I think that that's really important and also I think you know in regard to that poem thinking about we live on the physical plane, which if you think about words like joy and sorrow, good, bad, those are words that can't exist without each other, right? They, they don't mean anything without the other one to push up against. And so just really taking into account like what the full human experience is and that both lightness and darkness are necessary on this plane to kind of grow. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I want to be thinking towards in the going forward here. I love that. What about, what about everyone else? Go ahead, Joanne. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there's a bat in my living room right now. I just want to say that I'm not freaked out by it, but some people are. Um, but what I was going to say is that um, that for me, like over this last year, I've been paying so much attention to what's outside the windows that that line about the bird in a good suit of feathers, which somehow implies that the bird has a suit of feathers that's more rumpled and, you know, gray than that one. 
So for me, it feels like noticing a bird in a good suit of feathers outside the window is pretty much says what my entire pandemic has been. Like I know what their lives are more than I know what my life is at this point. I watch them every day. So um, I really love that poem, by the way. I really love that poem. I'm so glad you do. And it's, oh my goodness, a bat in your house. It makes me think of the flying squirrels in your essay, The Fourth State of Matter. <laughs> I hear a lot of thumping going on in the other room. So oh. I don't know what that means. Um, uh oh. I, I would be freaking out. <laughs> I did just get a text saying, there is a bat in the living room. So I'm sort of glad I'm in here to tell you the truth. And there are two doors between me and whatever is happening out there. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Um, what about Catherine or Janine? What, what is your answer to that question? Well, I was, I mean, I was thinking, you know, it's so strange, isn't it? Because it's like a year now we've all been in this situation. And um, when, when the lockdown first happened in London, and I guess it was like mid-March last year, it was just the craziest, beautifulest spring. You know, it was insane. It was the flowers and the smells and because there was so little traffic and, and it was just like silence in London and it was so uncanny. And I felt it so strongly, this sense of um, dissonance between the kind of horrors that were unfolding that you know, I wasn't personally seeing because I was protected from them because I had a job that I could work from home and, you know, was in a, in a privileged position. But, you know, knowing what was happening and then just having these kind of almost like ecstatic experiences of hearing more bird song and going for these long walks in this glorious spring and like stopping and smelling the flowers in a way that I never would do. And I found it just so confusing because it was so beautiful and so kind of horrific at the same time and I feel that you know now what's happened is this kind of um you know so on the one hand it was like thinking I need more contact with the natural world than I usually have I need to look more and pay closer attention to to what's around me and the kind of beauty that's around me but now after like however many months of being on Zoom and teaching on Zoom and everything, everything on Zoom, I get a different kind of weird like dissonance, which is just feeling so disembodied the whole time, you know, doing as we're all doing all these events and conversations and, and they're so kind of intense and they're intense in a different way because we're not in the room, but there's things that we miss because we're not in the room. And at the end of an event, you just, it's over, that's it. And you're just, but you're still sitting in this chair that you've been doing all your other things from in the course of the day. And, and I sort of, I, I now feel like I, I have a need and a desire and a kind of heightened awareness now of my pleasure in just being in a room with people and smelling people and breathing horrible dirty air, you know? It's, it's like, I'm finding that really painful at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm desperate to have more human contact. You are not alone. I think everyone is feeling that way. Even those of us who are sometimes more introverted and don't like being around people. I, I miss being around people for sure. Janine, what about you? Um, well, I think my um, astrological sign is going to come into play a little bit here with my answer because I feel like a year of pandemic and um, social unrest and uprising has given me a, a, just a lot of um, urgency toward prioritization. And I think a more discernment in what really matters to me. Um, and I live in Minneapolis, so this is where George Floyd was murdered. And we, you know, really were, um, yeah, our city, it was, you know, was on fire for a couple of weeks and it was an incredibly intense, it was, it's, it's really hard even to, to speak articulately about what that was like. And I mean, even that is a place of privilege because of never really having um, lived somewhere where there's war 
you know, um, you know, here in the United States, we are sheltered in that way, but it, it was, um, yeah, it was a really surreal time. And I, um, my daughter was maced, um, you know, we had a semi here, um, drive into a, a, a crowd of, uh, protesters who were legally, you know, marching on the freeway. So it was really crazy. And I came out of that um, and have, you know, as the months have marched along, feeling just a lot of um, it, it really purposeful, you know, feeling like I just want um, to, you know, without, without making it, um, you know, like without making myself crazy about it, but I just want to, to, do what matters in any given moment and let go of what doesn't. And I think that for me requires a lot of like radical self-honesty because it is easy. I, I, someone earlier said something about like, um, you can go after something that you think you want or, you know, and find out, oh, it didn't really mean that much. And I think that often we can know that before we put all that energy into going after it, or at least I feel like I can do better at that. I feel like if when I really listen, when if I can find that still place to actually back to the body, like really listen to what my body is telling me about what matters, um, then I can spare myself, you know, some of that um, frantic grasping and chasing after stuff that isn't really going to, um, not only is it not always what I wanted. Sometimes I don't want it at all. I just got caught up in something. So, so just being more in tune with that, like being able to recognize what is my actual desire. Like if desire is without a star and yearning for direction toward becoming, that's what I want to follow. You know, that's the path that I want to be on. John Teal, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to just add something because, you know, it came into my mind as Janine was speaking, but like, I think a part of my desire to care for my body better than I have been um, definitely did come with being hit in the face uh, last year with this country's desire for my death and realizing like more completely that it's foundational. And then like, so the care then would be also an act of resistance on my part. So yeah, I think that that definitely can't be ignored in like that desire to like thrive. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I have a, a question that's inspired by my friend, the writer Rachel Eit, who studied with Joanne and she um, wants to know where desire goes when it disappears and how do we get it back or deal with the dormancy of desire? And this could apply to writing, sex, life in general, however you want to interpret it. No one? I have something quick to say about it. I'll kick us off on that because I think that it um, has to do with, I do think it has to do with vulnerability and I think desire going, going dormant can be really safe. You know, it can feel really safe to just sort of let that desire kind of calm down. And, but it can also be really numb. You know, it can also be very, um, yeah, disconnected. And so I think of it as, um, and I'm speaking specifically about writing right now or like the, the creative desire, the thing, that thing that, you know, like you really want it, but you know that it's going to hurt because you're lots of times not going to get it or it's not going to turn out or, you know. But like, I think you do have to fuel it. You know, like I think of it like as a little pot belly stove and you got to put the wood in it and keep it burning because I do think it can burn out if you don't tend to it. Um, and that sometimes um, after, you know, after a few licks that scar, you know, like we might be inclined to maybe just not stoke it for a while, um, but, but there's a danger in that too. There also yeah. might be um, something interesting. Am I, am I speaking to Rachel now, Michelle? Is she, did she ask this question? Yeah, she's not here, she, but she's gonna watch the recording later, so. Yeah. Hi, Michelle. I mean, hi, Rachel, later. That um, 
that there might be something really interesting in the idea of letting go of desire, of just simply saying that seeking that takes us to bad places sometimes. I don't mean that desire takes us to bad places, but I mean seeking it might. So the interesting thing might be to just sit back and see what comes after that. I agree with that. Yeah. Don Teal, yeah. were you going to say? Something? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I don't know. Like, where does it go? I mean, it can turn into repulsion, you know, after a certain amount of time. So it's desire in the opposite direction, right? Or maybe it turns into peace or apathy. Like if you stop the seeking, like Joanne said, though, so, I don't know. I have to think about that more, but that's interesting. Do you want to add anything, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, Janine, when you were talking, I was thinking about how um, I think sometimes there's a kind of self-protection at work with, you know, when you sort of see people who have sort of stopped desiring or given given up on desire or desire has given up on them or, you know, and I'm thinking about, um, I was thinking about Chanel Miller's memoir, Know My Name, um, about her experience after uh, Brock Turner sexually assaulted her and the, you know, the whole case, the whole court case and all of that. Um, and she writes so beautifully about um, having to sort of protect herself from so much hostility and, and, you know, vilification in the media and, you know, just all the horrible circus around that case. Um, in addition, obviously, to the experience of the assault. Um, and she talks about how for a long time she couldn't experience any desire or pleasure. And she talks about becoming sort of like wood, like very impenetrable and, and hard as a way to protect herself. But that also of course means that nothing could sort of touch her, nothing could reach her. She couldn't experience any pleasure or sensation. Um, and she talks about a very kind of slow, gradual process of learning to kind of re-enter a relationship with her own body. And it's so beautiful, that book. It's such an incredible, accomplished kind of reckoning with, with that. And I think that, you know, that's something I think about a lot is how, um, how we have to do things in order to adapt to often very difficult circumstances. And that those ways of adapting are completely understandable and sometimes necessary and that in themselves, you know, are just how somebody copes with an individual situation. Um, and, and that there's no, there's no shame in that, you know, there's no shame in, in responding to the situation that you've been placed in, in ways that are self-protective, but that might also be self-thwarting, that might be cutting off a source of pleasure for you or, or desire or ambition. Um, and in my book, there's part of the argument that I'm making, I think, is about trying to recognize when certain um, behaviors or arguments also are sort of strategic, you know, when when we have to make strategic adaptations to the situations that we're in, but that it's really important to recognize that those are strategic, that they are a way of coping with violence and with the threat of violence, and that it's politically really important to see that we are not those strategies, you know, that, that you can distinguish between the capacity in you and, and, and all the kind of realms within you that maybe are not being facilitated or brought to life at the moment because you are maintaining a strategic kind of relationship to the violent world that we live in so i think it's it's so it's so important to kind of um always try to be aware you know in relation to oneself but also in relation to others thinking you know why why is this person struggling with sexual desire or with not being able to finish their book or you know, not being able to have ambition for their own life or whatever it is, is that there's always a reason. There's always a strategic reason why people do the things they do and that we can be so much more compassionate about all the kind of ways in which we all, you know, muck up our own lives or thwart ourselves or end up harming others because 
most of the time people are trying to cope with the situations that they're in, in sometimes very painful ways. That is so true. Thank you. Um, we have time, I think, for one or two audience questions. So I'm going to try to get through them really quickly. Um, the first is from Ella, who was in my Tin House workshop with Joanne. Um, so hi, Ella. It's good to see you here. This question is specifically for Joanne, but anyone else who wants to chime in can respond too. It's how does the meaning in your images emerge before or after you write? Are you drawn to the image and as you observe and start to describe the meaning comes? Or do you understand the meaning you are creating and find the images that help you express that meaning? I understand the question. Um, and it's the, it's the former. It's that the image sparks something. And then in the description of that and in the folding it into the story and making it resonate in the story, like recur or whatever that means to resonate, um, that's, when, that's when I feel like in my process, I start to pull the meaning out, mm. and understand it for myself. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Does anyone else want to respond yeah, to that? That's the same for me. Um, I'm a really imagistic thinker. So things usually come to me as an image or, you know, so all day I feel like I'm either translating images into words or vice versa, or trying to figure that out. And I think for me, the meaning comes in that translation. Like when I'm doing the translating, then it's like, oh, okay, I understand like what this means. But again, it's, it's that way with writing is that um, like Catherine was saying, it's like you have to get to the end of it before you even realize what you have. So it's like the first draft for me is always like telling myself the story. And then in subsequent drafts, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate it to somebody else that's outside of my brain. So yeah, image first, I think, and then then what it means. Beautiful. Great. Um, Catherine and Janine, do you wanna answer that or should I ask the last question? I'm just gonna say, same, same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, but um with me I, I I've noticed you know again it's like I think I can only get clarity on what I do in writing after the fact <laughs> um but I think it's you know I write non-fiction and um but it is often very driven by a particular visual image so from film or from a novel or something something very kind of scenic and kind of dynamic that um that is often the sort of trigger for for then me wanting to work something out you know seeing seeing something visual that that I don't feel I understand but that I want to understand and it's through the writing that I try to understand why I'm fascinated or perplexed by something so I often start from a position of just, I mean, not knowing why I want to write about something and then gradually realizing, oh, this, oh, this is why that film is really interesting to me. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. I'm gonna ask Kayla's question. She says, I would love to know if there are any works of art, either books, films, music, paintings, poems that the panelists have either found helpful when writing about desire or that they feel express desire in a powerful way, expresses desire in a powerful way. I'll go first with mine, because I, I, I peeked at the q and I cheated and I was like, okay, <laughs> let me get an answer ready. Uh, but um, so I think for me, one example might be Sally Mann's photography, mm. especially her um, body farm series and then the series with her children. But I think there's just something like, that's the thing that I'm yearning for. It's like that desire and also that stigma and like actually capturing it on the page and making somebody sit with the things that we don't want to because it's uncomfortable, right? But like that you sometimes need to face about yourself or the world around you. So yeah, that's one. Anyone else? Am I muted? No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about um, a real contemporary example, Carmen Maria Machado's um, Her Body and Other Parties um, is, a, is a, I think, a kind of masterful exploration of desire and its complexities. Um, yeah, that's a great question, by the way. <laughs> really great question. Wonderful. Yeah, that book is so, is so amazing on, on 
desire in, in young women as well, especially, I think. Um, I, um, I There's a lot of kind of novels and artworks and um, films in, in, in what I write, because, you know, as I said, they're often the like the starting point for my thinking. But I guess one I would mention is um, the French filmmaker Claire Denis. She um, she's made tons of films, all very, very different from one another. But um, there's one I really like that was sort of fairly low budget and a bit kind of shonky and grainy um, called Vendredi Soir, Friday Night. And it's just, um, it's just a woman who is moving house and there's a massive rainstorm in Paris and she's driving through Paris to meet some friends for dinner and she meets a stranger and they have sex in a hotel and then they go and have a meal and that's it. <laughs> and it is somehow so simple, but so kind of, um, so resonant and, and captures the kind of, like all the, all the currents that lie under sexual desire, I think, all the sort of other parts of your life that are kind of uh, creating the desire or impinging on it or obstructing it. Um, and, and yet also at one level, it's just a really beautiful portrait of a woman experiencing pleasure in a very kind of simple way that I actually think is very, very rare in, to, to be represented in, in film and TV. So yeah, it's a really beautiful film. I want to see that. Thank you. And I see, um, Don Teal, you posted Luster, which is one of my favorite books of the past year, Raven Milani, yes, for um, how it shows desire in Black women and how that's perceived. Yes, yes, yes. Love yeah, that book. I had such a hard time concentrating and reading in 2020. And that was like one of the first books I picked up in 2020 where I just was like immersed. I was in it and I was really thankful for that experience. Yeah, Raven was on a previous Red Ink too. Um, Joanne, last but not least, what would you recommend? any piece of art dealing with desire. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I wasn't trying, I wasn't thinking of what my answer would be. I was just listening to everybody else's. So um, when people ask me for like what I've been reading or watching or for recommendations, I go blank. So I'll have an answer for you, Michelle, at about 3 a.m. <laughs> I'll send it to you tomorrow. But I do love everybody's suggestions. 